Ha ha. Okay, so there is. Okay. Okay. All right. Now it appears that I have solved this, I think. Let me just go back and double check now. Um, temporarily solved it anyway. We'll see. So let's see if it shows up on this page. Okay. There. That seems to be it. Okay. So should be able to get it on either page. Um, I'm still not quite exactly sure what happened, but what I've had to do is put it in through my author page, which is the non, the, not my personal page, although they're both personal pages. Anyway, I hope that makes sense now. Um, I, I think, uh, anyway, seems to be working. I seem to have viewers. Um, I think that those who now check back in on my regular page um, will find it. For some reason, it, it, it sent it to the other page, but not to the home page. I don't know why. I can't figure it out. Anyway, sorry for the delay. Um, thank you for, for your patience. Um, I still don't have any idea exactly why that happened, except I did just re- um, redid my, um, uh, system software. So that may have something to do with it. It may have thrown Facebook off somehow that I updated to some post 2013 software and caught it completely unprepared. I don't know. Anyway, whatever the case is, we seem to be working. We seem to be functioning. So I'm just going to assume for the best. Um, although I think at this point, the only people who are getting the broadcast are probably the people who came in on the other channel, but um, whatever. I've done my best there. We just got it picked up a bunch more. So I guess people have now found it on the original page. I had to, anyway, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. Hi, <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever in the world you may happen to be. I'm Tad. I am here to read and um, uh, mess with technology. Um, because that's what I do, I guess. It's not really my idea of a fun time trying to figure out what has gone wrong or what weird thing has happened since the last time I had this set up because um, it seems like every time something different happens. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, as uh, all of you know, it is Sunday. It is 1 a.m. in the morning here in California. Um, had a fairly good day in terms of getting some work done, which is always one of the measures that I have. Um, it's nice to be at a stage where I'm, when I'm writing things, because then I can always say, well, at least I wrote some pages today, um, did a few other things, cleaned up after various animals, you know, stuff like that. Um, anything else of interest to report? Eh. Not really. Um, I've finally got the end of Navigator's Children in sight. I just realized I got past a crucial scene today, um, which was really bugging me because it was one of those logistical nightmares where you know a bunch of things have to happen, but in your mind's eye as you're trying to sort of block the scene, those of you who've been in theater or and know anything about it will know what I mean when I say blocking the scene. 
And as a writer, that's how I tend to think of it. But that's because I was a theater kid before I was a writer. And blocking, of course, is when you sort of walk through uh, a scene and you kind of decide, okay, now you have to come downstage so that you become the focal point. And, you know, we'll bring the light up on you and drop it down in the background. But then when you in the background there have to suddenly get up and step forward, um, wait until this part, blah, 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 you know, all that kind of stuff. So when you're writing, for me anyway, when I'm writing a scene in a book, I'm doing much the same thing. I have to figure out what's going to happen, how I want the reader to follow what's going on. In other words, you know, if I'm... If I put too much dialogue in there, I may be distracting from the the actual physical activities that I want the reader to be aware of, vice versa. You know, if I don't have um, dialogue, I may be leaving the reader uncertain as to what the character's opinions are about what's going on or their emotional state or, you know, things like that. So the first thing you do is you block through the scene in your mind. You say, okay, what, what has to happen here? What do I need to have happen? So that's what I was working on today, one that had been puzzling me for several days because I knew the things that had to happen and I knew the things I wanted to have happen, but what I didn't couldn't do was find a way to make it happen in an organic way because, of course, that's the other thing. That's where the blocking comes in is... Again, like theater, you have to make something look as though it's inevitable, as though it is uh, a piece of life. Even when you're doing something very stylized, it has to be a piece of life. It has to feel like the characters are doing what they're doing because it makes sense to them at the time. So much as you might want to have something happen in a certain way, you may realize none of these characters would do that. Or... These characters are not physically or geographically or whatever in a position to do this thing that I wanted to have happen. So how can I make it happen instead? Um, so that's what I was dealing with. And it had been bugging me for, for several days and just could not get through it. And finally just went, well, what if this happens, this happens, this happens? And I, Deb also said something that although I didn't wind up using her suggestion, which was a perfectly good suggestion, it's just that it sent me off in another direction. Um, at, when she said it, I went, yeah, that's interesting. But then again, what if blah, 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 you know, and oftentimes that's the only help you need is for someone to say something that, that sends your mind off in a different direction. So I'm in a much better mood. <laughs> I'm more psychologically secure tonight for having finally dealt with that thing that was bugging me. Um, and so as of that point, I realized, okay, now that I've done that, I can actually go into the very last section, um, you know, the, the sort of end of the book, as it were, because there's still this one set piece that has to happen. But I don't have to, I don't have to build bridges anymore from where I was to where the set piece is going to happen. I can go almost straight to it or pretty darn close by my standards. Now, mind you, these are the standards of a man who writes 12, 1500 page books. So um, it may not happen as quickly as it might with other writers, but basically, basically it's getting there. Anyway, what else? Anything else since we had a late start today? Um, no, let me just say hello to everybody and then I'm going to read. Okay, so... Uh, Ron says, is it working now? I hope so. I hope so. We appear to have finally hooked it up and I appear to have gotten the camera to focus and everything else. So, ah, God, it would be lovely to do something like this in a studio and have other people worry about things like that. But then again, there's lots of things that I do that would be wonderful if I had other people <laughs> doing the hard parts for me. I remember, um, playing with my friends, Andy and Rick and Pat and playing music with them and we would sort of ever since back when we first started back in high school um which is a long time ago now you know we always kind of like wow if we only had roadies <laughs> if we weren't always hauling our own gear around and of course we never got famous enough or successful enough we occasionally would get volunteer help but uh you know we never were making any money and we could never afford to hire anybody so that's kind of the way i feel with my broadcasts as well you know it's it's like wouldn't it be nice if I had an engineer? Well, I don't. Wouldn't it be nice if I had a, a, a secretary or an assistant who could answer my mail for me because I'm always months, if not years, behind on that? Yeah, that would be nice too. 
Um, am I a rich writer who could afford that? Nah, <laughs> no, no, but that's okay. That's right. It keeps me in touch with the people. That's, that's my excuse and I'm sticking with it. Anyway, so hello, Ron. Yes, it seems to be solved. I hope that's the case. Um, but let me check in with everybody else. So here we had, oh, now why are my, oh God, my chat things are disappearing on me. So I saw, I see Penny, but Penny's about to disappear. Oh God, I'm going to have to deal with this. Um, anyway, I saw Ron, I saw someone else say hi and I missed it. Tamika, first time. Very excited. Thanks for taking the time. Well, thank you for taking the time to join me, Tamika, and very nice to have you. Anamika. So we have Tamika and Anamika. Very good. Good morning. Um, and Holger, hello. Holger is having Bavarian breakfast, including Weisswurst. Yeah, I like Weisswurst, actually, with pretzels and wheat beer. Sounds excellent. Oktoberfest, baby. Sarah, hello, hello. Uh, greetings from the air traffic control tower at Frankfurt Airport. Well, hello back to you. And hello, Frankfurt, which I, where I haven't been for several years, but I, I miss it. I've had some very nice times uh, in Frankfurt. Um, 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 I seem to be keep getting the same. Oh, it's just moving. Okay, never mind. Mark, good morning. Oh, it's actually, it's printing everything twice. So I guess I'm getting it from both sites now. How bizarre. Okay, well, just bear with me because every single comment on here has been on here twice. Uh, Wouter said, hello, good morning all, and also from Iris, who is just finishing the final breakfast preparations. All right, hello, Wouter. Good to see you. Christina, good morning. Oh, I'm sorry you're not feeling well. Well, I hope you feel better. Ron, hello. Keep getting booted, but looking forward to... Oh, yeah, okay, well, good. I hope we're on now, and I hope everybody is locked in. Um, David. Good evening, David. Good to see you. Donatella. Buongiorno. Buongiorno, Donatella. Um, nice to have you with us. Rosalba. Good morning. Good morning. Um, yeah. It, all you can do in the case of a technology mess is reboot. You are absolutely right, Rosalba. And I learned that a long time ago. That's one of the few things I learned when I was working for Apple that is still useful 30 years or more later, uh, which is unplug it and plug it again. And actually, that's what I did this time. I just kept quitting and coming back on and quitting and coming back on. And then it finally showed up on the other site. And then I just made a link to that site. Anyway, um, so it's sliding back up and down again. But let's see what else we've got. All right. So Rosalba, I said hello to Ilva. Hello, hello. Good morning, sweetie. And Agnes, hello. Welcome aboard, Marion. Good morning from Germany. Good morning to you, Marion. Marion, and welcome, and nice to have you. Chris, but no notification. Yeah, I know. Well, we'll figure it out. I, I have a feeling I'm going to have to redo all of the uh, Facebook stuff because of maybe changing operating systems. I don't know. Isaac, good morning. 2 a.m. there. So, well, good to see you. That's right. You're in the Midwest, aren't you? Or somewhere out there. Um, Iowa? Utah? Utah, I think. Anyway, Kristen, hello. Good to see you. Yeah, it didn't notify. Yeah, that's because it didn't go through my page, which is what it's set up for, but it went through my author page instead. That's how I had to hook it up. So sorry about the confusion. Um, why do you have a five beyond your name? I don't know. I, it's Maybe it's keeping track of how many times you, you've commented or something. It's, it's the chat format is weird. I'm getting too two posts of everybody, or almost everybody. So that's even more confusing. It's not everybody, it's almost everybody. Like Rosalba, I only got one. Anyway, uh, I, I'm not gonna spend a lot more time worrying about this stuff, but hello, okay, David. David, I said hello to all already. Suzanne, checking in from Yorkshire. Um, <laughs> all kinds of things used to happen while I was on the air at KFJC. I got a lot of practice back in the days. Debbie, there's Debbie. The coffee has kicked in. Ty, hello. Good to see you. And Jeremy, hello, but you got to go to bed. Well, you just showed up to tell me, huh? Okay. I'm not hurt or anything. Okay. With that, I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. Oh, see, and there goes the focus. I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. I'll give the focus a second here to see if it'll come back. Come back, focus. Come back, little focus. I had to do the focus thing about three times before I started too. So um, it was like this, except much fuzzier for, for literally several minutes before the thing started. Okay, I'm just going to read before anything else goes wrong. 
Um, all right, so Binabic is telling he has rescued Simon from the Buchan, the Buchan attack, um, where Isgrimner and his Rimmer's men have been attacked in the rain out in the Frost March, or it's not the Frost March, it's Northern Urkin land, but they've been attacked. And Binabic has showed up riding on his wolf and has led Simon away from the scene of the battle with these little horrid things. Um, and so anyway, um, and then ben so Benedict is telling Simon, so Benedict has said to Simon that something about Morganes and Simon's realized that Benedict knows who Morganes is and is not just a casual accidental person that he's met. So Benedict is telling him about how he initially came down from the mountains with his master, Ukekuk, who was the singing man, sort of the wise man of his particular tribe of uh, Kanuk trolls. So anyway, and then Ukekuk, while attempting, getting ready to, to meet up with Morganes and contact him about some scary stuff that was going on, Ukekuk suddenly died while on a kind of a vision quest, I guess, for lack of a, a more fantasy-ish term. Anyway, Simon huddled in his cloak and watched the troll's face as he talked. Two days I had spent beside my master's burial place. A nice enough place it was, lying beneath unblocked sky. But my heart was sore because I knew he would be more happy up high in the mountains. I was thinking of what I should be doing, whether to continue on to Morganes in Urchester or return to my people and tell them the singing man Ukekuk was dead. I decided on the afternoon of the second day that I should return to Kanuk. I had to Ikanuk. I had no understanding of the importance of my master's talk with Dr. Morganes. I am still not understanding much, sadly to say. And I had other responsibilities. As I was calling Kantaka and scratching a last time between the horns of faithful one eye, a small gray bird fluttered down, landing on Ukekuk's mound. I recognized it as one of my master's messenger birds. It was very tired from carrying a heavy burden, a message, and, uh, and another thing. As I approached to capture it, Kantaka came crashing up along the underbrush. The bird, it is not surprising, was frightened and leaped into the air. I barely caught it. It was a nearness, Simon, but I caught it. It was written by Morganes, and the subject of the note was you, my friend. It told to the reader, who should have been my master, that you would be in danger and traveling alone from the Hayholt toward Naglamund. It asked my master to be helping you, without your knowing if such was possible. It said a few things more. Simon was riveted. This was a missing part of his own story. What other things, he asked. Things only for my master's eyes. Binabic's tone was kindly but firm. N now, it, it needs no saying that here was a difference. My master was asked a favor by his old friend, but only I could do that favor. This was also difficult, but from the moment I read Morganes's note, I knew I must fulfill his request. I set out that day before evening toward Urchester. <coughs> the note said I would be traveling alone. Morganes never thought he would escape. Simon felt tears coming and covered the effort of suppressing them with a question. How are you supposed to find me? Benedict smiled. By the use of Kanuk hard work, friend Simon, I had to pick up your trail. The signs of passing of a young man, no set destination, things of this kind. Kanuk hard work and a largeness of luck led me to you. A memory flared in Simon's heart, gray and fearful even in distant retrospect. Did you follow me across the lich yard, the one outside the city walls? 
It had not all been a dream, he knew. Something had called his name. The troll's round face, however, was unreassuringly blank. No, Simon, he said, carefully thinking. I was not discovering your track until, I think, upon the old forest road. Why? It's not important. Simon rose and stretched, looking around the damp flatland. He sat again and reached for the water skin. Well, I guess I understand now, but I have much to think about. It seems we should continue to Naglamond, I suppose. What do you think? Benebeck looked troubled. I am not sure, Simon. If the Buchan are active in the Frost March, the road to Naglamon Keep will be too dangerous for a pair of travelers alone. I must admit I am much worried about what to do now. I am wishing we had your Dr. Morganes here to advise us. Are you in so much peril, Simon, that we could not risk even a message to him somehow? I am not thinking he wants me to take you through such terrible dangers. It took a moment for Simon to realize that the he Binnebic was talking about was still Morganes. A second later, the astonishing realization struck. The troll did not know what had happened. Binnebic he began, and even as he spoke, he felt he was inflicting a kind of wound. He's dead. Dr. Morganes is dead. The little man's eyes flared wide for a moment, the white around the brown visible for the first time. An instant later, Binnebeck's expression froze in a dispassionate mask. Dead, he said at last, his voice so cold that Simon felt a strange defensiveness, as though it was somehow his fault, he who had cried so many tears over the doctor. Yes, Simon considered for a moment, then took a calculated risk. He died getting Prince Joshua and me out of the castle. King Elias killed him. Well, he had his man Pyrates do it anyway. Benebic stared into Simon's eyes, then looked down. I had knowledge of Joshua's captivity. In the letter it was mentioned. The rest is tidings that are very bad. He stood and the wind plucked at his straight black hair. Let me walk now, Simon. I must think what these things are meaning. I must think. His face still emotionless, the little man stepped away from the clutch of rocks. Kentaka immediately leaped up to follow, and Binnebeck started to shoo her off, then shrugged. She circled him in wide, lazy arcs as he moved slowly away, head bowed and small hands hidden in his sleeves. Thyman, Simon thought he looked far too small for the burdens that he carried. Simon was half hoping that when the troll returned, he might be carrying a fat wood pigeon or something similar. In this, he was disappointed. I, uh, I am sorry, Simon, the little man said, but it would have been small use anyway. We cannot have a smokeless fire with nothing around but wet brush, and a smoke beacon I do not think is good at the moment. Have some dried fish. The fish itself in short supply was neither filling nor tasty, but Simon chewed morosely at his piece. Who knew when he would next get a meal on this miserable adventure? I have been thinking, Simon. Your news, with no fault of yours, is hurtful. So soon after my master's death, to hear of the ending of the doctor, that good old man. Binnebeck trailed off, then bent and began shoving things back into his pack after first separating out several articles. These are your things. See, I was saving them for you. He handed Simon the two familiar cylindrical bundles. This other, Simon said, accepting the packages, 
Not, not the arrow, but this. He handed it back to Benebeck. It's writing by Dr. Morganes. Truthfully, Benebeck skinned back a corner of the rag wrappings. Things that will help us. I don't think so, Simon said. It's his life of Prester John. I, I read some of it. It's mostly about battles and things. Ah, yes. Benedict passed it back over to Simon, who pushed it through his belt. Too bad, that is. We could use his more specific words at this moment. The troll bent and continued pushing objects into his pack. Morgenes and Ukekuk, my master, they were belonging together to a very special group. He scooped something out of his belongings and held it up for Simon to see. It gleamed faintly in the overcast afternoon light, a pendant of a scroll and quill pen. Morganes had one of those, Simon said, leaning close to look. Indeed, Benedict nodded. This was my master's. It is a sigil belonging to those who join the League of the Scroll. There are, I was told by him, never more than seven members. Your and my master's are dead. There can be no more than five left now. He snapped his small hand shut on the pendant and dropped it into the sack. League of the Scroll, Simon wondered. What is it? A group of learned people who share knowledge. I have heard my master say. Perhaps something more, but he would never tell me. He finished the last of his packing and straightened up. I am sorry to be saying this, Simon, but I am afraid we must be walking again. Again? Aches he had forgotten suddenly flared in Simon's muscles. I am afraid it is needed. As I was telling, I have been much in thought. I have thought these things. He tightened his walking stick at the join and whistled for Kantaka. Firstly, I am bound for getting you to Naglamund. This has not been changed. It was unhappily only my resolution that was slipping. The problem is I... Do not trust the Frost March. You saw the book, and it is likely you would prefer not to see them again. But it is northward we must travel. I am thinking, then, that we must go back to Aldhurt. But, Benebeck, how will we be any safer there? What's to keep those digger things from coming after us in the forest, where we probably can't even run? Oh, a good question to ask. I spoke to you once of the old heart, of its age, and and I, I cannot think of a word in your language, Simon, but soul or spirit may be giving you an idea. The book in, can pass beneath the old forest, but not easily. There is power in the old heart's roots, power that is not to be lightly broached by such creatures. Also, there is someone there I must see, someone who must hear the telling of what happened to my master and yours. Simon was already tired of hearing his own questions, but asked anyway, Who is that? Her name is Jeloi. A wise woman she is, one known as a Valada, a Rimmersgard word that. Also, she can perhaps help us to reach Naglamund, since we will have to be crossing from the forest side on the east over the Weldhelm, a route that is not known to me. Simon pulled his cloak on, hooking the worn clasp beneath his chin. Must we leave today? he asked. It is so late in the afternoon. Simon, Benebic said as Kantaka jogged up, tongue lolling. Please believe me, even though there are things that I cannot yet tell to you, we must be true companions. I need your trust. It is not only the business of Elias's kingship that is at stake. We have lost, both of us, people who we were holding dearly. 
an old man and an old troll who knew much more than we are knowing. They were both afraid. Brother Dokais, I am thinking, died of fright. Something evil is waking, and we are foolish if we spend more time in open ground. What is waking, Binibic? What evil? Dokais said a name. I heard him just before he died. He said, you need not, Binibic tried to interrupt, but Simon paid him no heed. He was growing tired of hints and suggestions. Storm King, he finished resolutely. Binibic looked quickly around as though he expected something terrible to appear. I know, he hissed. I heard too, but I do not know much. Thunder rolled beyond the distant horizon. The little man looked grim. The Storm King is a name of dread in the dark north. Simon, a name out of legends to frighten with, to conjure with. All I have are small words my master was giving me sometimes, but it is enough to make me sick with worry. He shouldered his bag and started off across the muddy plain toward the blunt, crouching line of hills. That name, he said, his voice incongruously hushed in the midst of such flat emptiness, is of itself a thing to wither crops, to bring fevers and bad dreaming. Rain and bad weather, Simon asked, looking up at the ugly, lowering sky. And other things, Benebeck replied, and touched his palm to his jacket just above his heart. Chapter 24, The Hounds of Urkenland. Oh, by the way, I don't know if any of you remember when I was saying something about the chapter chapter numbers and chapter heads. Um, this was not the one I was talking about, but chapter 24 has a repeated theme throughout all three books. Remember that originally this was three volumes, but it was only in paperback that it was four. Um, so chapter 24 in Dragonbone Chair, The Hounds of Urkenland. Chapter 24 in... The uh, Stone of Farewell also has a thematic connection to that. And same thing, if I remember correctly, with Chapter 24 to Green Angel Tower. But I'll let any of you who have books around look those up for yourself and see if I'm remembering rightly or not. Anyway, Chapter 24, The Hounds of Urkenland. Simon dreamed that he was walking in the pine garden of the Hayhold, just outside the dining hall. Above the gently swaying trees hung the stone bridge that connected hall and chapel. Although he felt no sensation of cold, indeed he was not aware of his body at all except as something to move him from one place to another. Gentle snake slip. <laughs> Although he felt no sensations of cold, indeed he was not aware of his body at all except as something to move him from one place to another, gentle flakes of snow were filtering down around him. The fine, needled edges of the trees were beginning to blur beneath blankets of white, and all was quiet. The wind, the snow, Simon himself all moved in a world seemingly without sound or swift motion. The unfelt wind blew more fiercely now, and the trees of the sheltered garden began to bend before Simon's passage, parting like ocean waves around a submerged stone. The snow flurried, and he moved forward into the opening, into a tree-lined hallway of swirling white. On he went, the trees leaning back before him like respectful soldiers. The garden was never this long, was it? Suddenly Simon felt his eyes drawn upward. At the end of the snowy path stood a great white pillar, looming far over his head into the dark skies. Of of course, he thought to himself in dreamy half-logic, it's Green Angel Tower. He could never walk directly from the garden to the base of the tower before, but things had changed since he'd been gone. Things had changed. But if it's the tower, he thought, staring upward at the immense shape, why does it have branches? It's not the tower. 
or at least it isn't anymore. It's a, it's a tree, a great white tree. Simon sat upright, staring. What is a tree? asked Binnebeck, who sat close by, re-stitching Simon's shirt with a bird bone needle. He finished a moment later and handed it back to the youth, who extended a freckled arm from beneath his sheltering cloak to claim it. What is a tree? And was your sleeping good? A dream, that's all, Simon said, muffled for a moment as he pulled the shirt over his head. I dreamed that Green Angel Tower turned into a tree. He looked at Benebeck quizzically, but the troll only shrugged. A dream, Benebeck agreed. Simon yawned and stretched. It had not been particularly comfortable sleeping in a protected crevice on the side of a hill, but it was eminently preferable to spending a night unprotected on the plain. He had seen the logic of that quickly enough once they had gotten moving. Sunrise had come while he slept, inconspicuous behind the blanket of clouds, just a smear of pinkish-gray light across the sky. Looking back from the hillside perch, it was difficult to tell where the sky left off and the misty plains began. The world seemed a murky and unformed place this morning. I saw fires in the night while you were sleeping, the troll said, startling Simon out of his reverie. Fires? Where? Benevec pointed with his left hand southward along the plain. Back there. Do not be worrying. I think they are a far way off. It is quite the possibility they have nothing to do with us. I suppose so. Simon squinted into the gray distance. Do you think it might be his Grimner and his Rimmer's garters? It is doubtful. Simon turned to look at the little man. But you said they would get away, that they'd survive. The troll gave him an exasperated look. If you would wait, you would hear. I am sure they survived, but they were traveling north, and I am doubting they would turn back. Those fires were farther toward south, as though, as though they were traveling up from Urkenland. Simon finished. Yes, said Binnebeck, a little testily. But it could be they are traders or pilgrims. He looked around. Where has Kantaka now gone to? Simon grimaced. He knew a dodge when he saw one. Very well, it could be anything. But you were the one counseling speed yesterday. Are we to wait so we can see firsthand if these are merchants or or diggers the joke felt more than a little sour the last word had not tasted good in his mouth not being stupid is important benebeck grunted in disgust boganic the bukin light no fire they hate things that are bright and no we will not be waiting for these fire builders to reach us we are heading back to the forest, as I was telling you. He gestured back over his head. On the hill's far side, we will be within sight of it. The brush, the brush crackled behind them, and Troll and Boy jumped in surprise. It was only Kantaka, traversing erratically down the hillside, nose held tight to the ground. When she reached their campsite, she butted Binnebeck's arm until he scratched her head. Kantaka has a cheerful mood, hmm? The troll smiled, showing his yellow teeth. Since we have the advantage of a day with heavy clouds, which will be covering the smoke of a campfire, I am thinking we can at least have a decent meal before we again take to our feet. Are you in favor? Simon tried to make his expression a serious one, I suppose I could eat something, if I must, he said, if you really think it's important. Binnebeck stared, trying to decide if Simon actually disapproved of breakfast, and the boy felt laughter trying to bubble free. Why am I acting like a mooncalf, he wondered. We're in terrible danger, and it won't get any better soon. 
Binnebick's puzzled look was finally too much, and the laughter burst forth. Well, he answered himself, a person can't worry all the time. Simon sighed, contented, and allowed Kuntaka to take the few remaining bits of squirrel meat from his fingers. He marveled at the delicacy the wolf could exhibit with those great jaws and gleaming teeth. The fire was a small one, since the troll did not believe in unnecessary risks. A thin stream of smoke curled sinuously in the wind sliding along the hillside. Binnebick was reading Morgenes' manuscript, which he had unwrapped with Simon's permission. It is my hope you understand, the troll said without looking up, that you will not be trying that with any other wolf beside my friend Kantaka. Of course not. It's amazing how tame she is. Not tame, Binnebick was emphatic. She has a bond of honor with me and it is including those who are my friends. Honor? Simon asked lazily. I am sure you know that term, much as it is bandied about in southern lands. Honor? Are you thinking such a thing cannot exist between troll and beast? Binnebick glanced over, then went back to leafing through the manuscript. Oh, I don't think about much about anything these days. Simon said airily, leaning forward to squatch, scratch Kantaka's deep-furred chin. I'm just trying to keep my head down and reach Naglamund. You are making a gross evasion, Binnebick muttered, but did not pursue the subject. For a while there was no sound on the hillside but the riffling of parchment. The morning sun climbed up through the sky. Here, Binnebick said at last, listen now. Ah, daughter of the mountains, but I am missing Morgenis more just from reading his words. Do you know of Nerilar, Simon? Certainly, where King John beat the Nabani. There's a gate at the castle all covered with carvings of it. <coughs> you are right. So then, here Morgenis is writing of the battle of Nerilar, where John was first meeting the famous Sir Camaris. May I read to you? Simon suppressed a twinge of jealousy. The doctor had not intended that his manuscript be for Simon and no one else, he reminded himself. So after Ardrivis's decision, a brave one, some said, arrogant, said others, to meet this upstart northern king in the flat plain of the meadow thriving before Lake Mirme proved a disaster. Our drivers pulled the bulk of his troops back into the Onestrine Pass, a narrow way between the mountain lakes Iadni and Clodu. What Morgenes speaks of, Benebic explained, is that our drivers, the imperator of Naban, did not believe Prester John could come against him with great force so far from Urkinland. But the Pedruanese islanders, who were always being in the Nabandai shadow, made secret treaty with John and helped to supply his forces. King John cut Ardrivis' legions in ribbons near the meadow thriving, a thing unsuspected as possible by the proud Nabandai. Do you see? I think so. Simon was not sure, but he had heard enough ballads about Nerulaw to recognize most of the names. Read some more. I shall do so. Let me only be finding the part I wanted to read for you. He scanned down the page. Oh! And so, as the sun sank behind Mount Onestris, the last sun for 8,000 dead and dying men, young Camaris whose father, Benedrivis Savinita, had taken the imperator's staff from his dying brother, Ardrivis, only an hour before, led a charge of 500 horse, the remainder of the imperial guard, in, quiet, in quest of vengeance. Binnebeck, Simon interrupted. Yes? Who took what from which? Binnebeck laughed. 
Forgive me. It is a net full of names to capture at once, is it not? Ardrivus was the last imperator of Naban. Although his empire was no larger, you are seeing, than what is the duchy of Naban today. Ardrivus fell out with Prester John, King John, likely because Ardrivus knew that John had designs on a united Ostenard and that eventually there would be being conflict in any way. I will not bore you with all the fighting, but this was their last battle, as you know. Ardrivus, the imperator, was killed by an arrow, and his brother, Benedrivus, became the new imperator for the rest of that day only, ending with Naban surrendering. Camaris was the son of Benedrivus, and being young too, perhaps fifteen years. And so for that afternoon he was the last prince of Naban, as sung's Songs are sometimes calling him. Understood now? Better. It was all those heiresses and ivises that left me behind for a moment. Binnebeck picked up the parchment and continued reading. Now, with the coming of Camaris onto the field, the tired armies of Urkenland were much distraught. The young prince's troops were not fresh, but Camaris himself was a whirlwind, a storm of death, and the sword thorn that his dying uncle had given him was like a fork of dark lightning. Even at that late moment, the records say, the forces of Urkenland might have been routed, but Prester John came onto the field, bright nail clutched in his gauntleted fist, and cut a path through the Nabani Imperial Guard until he was face to face with the gallant Camaris. This is the part I wanted especially you to hear, Benedict said as he leafed forward to the next sheet. This is very good, Simon said. Will Prester John cleave him in twain? Ridiculous snorted the troll. How then would they have come to be the fastest and most famous of friends? Cleave him in twain, he resumed. The ballads say they fought all the day and into the night, but I doubt greatly that was so. Certainly they fought a long while, but doubtless the twilight and darkness had new, nearly arrived anyway, and it only seemed to some of the tired observers that these two great men had battled all the day long. What thinking your Morganes does, Benedict chortled. Whatever the truth, they traded blow after blow, clanging and hammering on each other's armor as the sun sank and the ravens fed. Neither man could gain an upper hand, even though Camaris's god had long since been defeated by John's troop. Still none of the Urkenlanders dared to interfere. By chance, at last, Camaris's horse stepped in a hole, breaking its leg, and fell with a great scream, trapping the prince beneath it. John could have ended it there, and few would have blamed him. But instead, observers uniformly swear, he helped the fallen knight of Naban out from under his steed, gave him back his sword, and when Camaris proved sound, continued the fight. Adon, breathed Simon, impressed. He had heard the story, of course, but it was a different thing entirely to hear it confirmed in the doctor's wry, confident words. So they struggled on and on, until Prester John, who was, after all, over twenty years Camaris's senior, grew weary and stumbled, falling to the ground at the feet of the Prince of Naban. Camaris, moved by the power and honor of his opponent, forwent slaying him and instead held thorn at John's gorget and asked him to promise to leave Naban in peace. John, who had not expected his mercy to be repaid in kind, looked around at the field of Nerilah empty but for his own troops, thought for a moment, 
and then kicked Camara Savinita in the fork of his legs. No, said Simon, taken aback. Kantaka raised a sleepy head at the exclamation. Binibic only grinned and continued to read from Morganis's writings. John then stood in his turn over the sorely wounded Camaras and told him, You have many lessons to learn, but you are a brave and noble man. I will do your father and family every courtesy and take good care of your people. I hope in turn you will learn the first lesson, the one I have given you today, and that is this. Honor is a wonderful thing, but it is a means, not an end. A man who starves with honor does not help his family. A king who falls on his sword with honor does not save his kingdom. When Camaris recovered, so awed was he by his new king that he was John's most faithful follower from that day forward. Why did you read that to me? Simon said. He felt more than a little insulted by the glee that Binibic had displayed while reading about the foul practices of the greatest hero of Simon's country. Still, they had been Morgenes' words, and when you thought about them, they made old King John seem more like a real person and less like a marble statue of St. Sutron catching dust on the cathedral facade. It seemed to be interesting, Binibic smiled impishly. No, that was not the reason, he explained quickly as Simon frowned. Truly, I was wanting you to take a point, and I thought Morgenes could do it with more ease than I. You did not want to leave the men of Rimmersgard, and I understand your feeling. It was not, perhaps, the most honorable way of behaving. Neither, however, was it honorable for me to leave my duties unfulfilled in Kanuk. But sometimes we must go against honor, or it is to say against what is obviously honorable. Are you understanding me? Not particularly. Simon's frown turned into a mocking, affectionate smile. Ah, Benebik gave a philosophical shrug. We say in Yikanuk, when it falls on your head, then you are knowing it is a rock. Simon pondered this stoically as Benebik returned his cooking things to his bag. And that's where we're stopping. So thank you for your patience. Sorry for the confusion. Um, check... To, uh, if I can't figure out what exactly happened tomorrow, I'll have to do the same thing, which means I'll be starting the broadcast on my um, on my author page and then putting a link on my um, regular home page. Um, but everything else should still work the same. So anyway, just to let you know. So with that. Thank you again for joining me. I will be back 7 p.m. to continue with the invention, adventures and inventions of Simon and Binibic as they make their way to the forest and uh, encounter the hounds of Urkenland, which are actually, here's a giveaway. Spoiler alert, the hounds of Nakiga, the hounds of the Norn North. So, but we will get to that at 7 p.m. Thank you for joining me. Thank you for your patience with all the weird technical glitches. Um, I'm glad we managed to get it going, and I will see you very soon. So take good care of yourself. Take good care of your loved ones, your friends and neighbors, and anybody who seems to need a helping hand, and I will see you all very soon. Peace, love, see ya.